Hi everybody! Welcome back to Living Traditions Homestead. My name is Sarah. Well, this past Thanksgiving I went a little bit overboard in the turkey department and I ordered a 25 pound turkey from our friends Ben and Andrea from VW Family Farm in Northern Arkansas. They raised the most beautiful non-GMO turkeys this past year and we decided that we were gonna buy one from them. 25 pound turkey sounded amazing! I thawed it out, I cooked it up, I brought it out of the, the oven and it was gigantic. <laughs> we ate tons of it on Thanksgiving Day. We have lots of leftovers and you guys, I still have a ton of turkey left. So I decided rather than doing what I've done in the past years, which is cut it up and put it in freezer bags and use it the rest of the year, which inevitably I forget about some of them and then they get freezer burned and they don't taste very good and ends up waste being wasted. This year I decided to go ahead and can the cooked turkey meat and bring you guys along with that process. Now, if you don't have turkey left over, that's fine because this process is gonna work for any cooked meat that you have left over from a big party or if you just had like a big roast that not everybody ate all of. Uh, say for instance you have a lot of meat in the freezer that's getting freezer burned and you want to cook it up and preserve it before it goes bad in the freezer. You can cook up a bunch of roasts, a bunch of chickens, a big turkey or whatever and do this process. It's all the same you guys and it's so easy. And a lot of us who raise our own food on our farms or homesteads, we're so busy in the summer preserving what's coming out of the garden that we often don't have time to worry about the meat that we might have that's getting freezer burned or just if we have an abundance of meat in the freezer that we wanna get out of there and clear up new room. This is an amazing thing to do in the winter time when we're not so busy in the gardens. So I'm so glad that you're gonna stick around while I can some of our leftover Thanksgiving turkey. Let's go ahead and open this up and see what we have to work with. Basically, we have eaten like this entire half of this turkey, but most of this half of the turkey is still in there. Uh, we need to take all the meat off of this gorgeous turkey, pick off anything that's still on the bones that we haven't gotten off uh, previous days, and we're going to just get that prepared for canning. Now, I will say that I am not wasting these precious bones here because I'm going to be making turkey bone broth later on at another time uh, and so I'm going to keep these just in a separate container here for me to get ready to make bone broth. First things first is to cut any of this meat that's still on these bones and save it for the canning process. I'm also gonna be saving this gorgeous skin for the uh, broth making process because it adds amazing flavor. Well, that part of the process is all done. So I have this amount of meat. I'm gonna be dicing up and starting to put in jars. And then here is the carcass that's left over. And these are the, all the bones and skin and kind of like the fatty or flabby parts uh, that I, I picked off and that will be incorporated into the broth that I'm gonna make. <clears throat> So now we can set this aside and we can start working on dicing up this turkey. 
Now I'm going to be using pint-sized regular mouth jars because this is a really good size or quantity of meat for me to throw into um, a soup or a casserole or to make um, chicken salad, something like that. And these are, this is fantastic. I have canned meat in quart sized jars and it's fine. It works great, it's wonderful, but sometimes it's just too much meat for us in a meal. Um, a lot of times my kids will like to make chicken salad and then they only use half of a jar, half of a quart sized jar, and then the rest of it ends up in the refrigerator. And sometimes it gets missed and I just hate for food to go bad in the refrigerator before we can use it all. So this time I am using pint sized jars. I'm also using the regular mouth jars um, because the lids are cheaper and I can actually fit more jars into a canner if they're the smaller regular mouth jars. Um, that's just why I do it. Everybody has their own way of doing things. So we're just gonna get these set up and start dicing up this meat and putting it into our jars. One thing that's important when you're canning any type of meat um, and whether it's already cooked or if it's raw is to make sure that you're not putting many of the fatty bits into the jar. Fat kind of comes to the top of the jar and if it boils over it all inside your jar during the canning process, it can compromise the seal and make it not seal or it could allow an opportunity for bacteria to get in there and um, spoil your meat that's in there. So it's important that when you're cutting the meat and going through the meat for canning, it doesn't have much of the fatty bits in there. I'm gonna press down the meat a little bit, but not super tight. And we're going for about an inch to an inch and a quarter of space from the top of the meat to the top of the jar. Well, that's all done. I ended up getting um, two, four, six, eight jars worth of the diced turkey. I do have just a tiny little bit left over that I'm just gonna put in a container, glass container in the refrigerator. It's enough for like a sandwich or a snack or something like that. And so now we can get on to the process of canning it. One thing I haven't mentioned yet is that we're gonna be using a pressure canner. So when you are canning meat, you absolutely have to use the pressure canning canning method because what's inside of the jars is not acidic whatsoever. So we'll be using one of my pressure canners and it's actually probably the most affordable small pressure canner that's out there. It's very versatile and is really nice for these kind of smaller batches of canning. When canning the cooked meat, we need to add some liquid to these jars. We can't just can them like this. So we have a choice. We can either um, backfill with boiling water or with broth. If I had been thinking about this and planning better, I probably could have used all of those bones that I saved to make a broth ahead of time so that I'd be backfilling with some really amazing turkey broth. But I didn't plan that well and I don't have any just like spare turkey broth or um, chicken broth to go in here. So I am going to be using water. So I do need to get some water into my pot here. We'll put it on the stove and get it boiling. Besides the water, the only other thing I'm gonna be adding to each of these jars is a half a teaspoon of salt. And I am using pink Himalayan salt. Now salt is an option. It doesn't, it's not required. It doesn't help with like the canning process or anything. It just adds some nice, I don't know, brings out the flavor of the chicken. It makes it more easily usable right out of the can without much seasoning. Um, and I really enjoy it. So we're just gonna put a half of a teaspoon of salt in each one of these. I do buy my salt <laughs> in bulk. I think I buy it in five or 10 pound bags. 
uh, from Azure Standard. And I really enjoy being able to buy salt and a lot of other things in bulk from them. They're a great company. They deliver to lots of neighborhoods across the country. Um, if you'd like to know more about them, you can visit them at azurestandard.com. You can also find the link to them in the description of this video. They're a really great company. While my water is warming up, I just want to show you the pressure canner that I'm going to be using uh, today. This is a really basic Presto pressure canner. It just uses a weight. It doesn't have a dial. It just has a weight that you put on top when it's the appropriate time. This pressure canner will hold 10 pint sized jars, the regular mouth pint sized jars, or seven quart jars. And this really, what, this was my first pressure canner. It has served me really well. I like to use it still for small batches. I have a couple others that are quite a bit bigger that will allow me to do um, two rows of pint size jars. And I have a different one, an All-American canner that will allow me to do two rows of quart size jars. But in this situation where I don't have a whole lot to can, I really do still just like this canner. Um, I have this listed in our Amazon shop if you want to take a look at it. Um, like I said, this is probably one of the least expensive, the most basic, really the easiest to use kind of pressure canner that's out there. It's really good for beginners. Okay, while uh, the water is also heating up, I do need to put water inside my pressure canner. In the Presto canners, they have a water level mark. However, you always want to hold on to your instruction manual for all of your pressure canners because it will tell you, well, it gives you the instructions that you can refer back to, but it'll also give you the exact quantity of water that you should put in there. I think the mark in this canner is about two quarts. Also in this pressure canner, and actually really with all pressure canners, in the bottom it comes with kind of one of these shelves that keeps your jars up off the bottom. And it has these holes in there that allow the steam and the water through it. That's really important to make sure that uh, you have one. Looks like our water is almost ready to put into our jar. So let's fill this with some water and get to canning. Our water is ready so we can get canning. Whew. All right, so what we're gonna do is we are gonna backfill this hot water into our jars until the water is just about one inch from the top or a little bit farther away. That looks about right, but I'm gonna check it. There are these measuring tools that you can get online, on Amazon or whatever, that helps you measure how far away the liquid is in your jar, how, big, how much of headspace you have. And so I'm checking to see that we have one inch of headspace. We have a little bit more than an inch of headspace and that's actually perfect. Now what I'm gonna do is use a chopstick or something like it to just poke down inside of there because we're releasing any of the trapped air bubbles down in there. We don't want air bubbles trapped in there. Okay, we're gonna remeasure it again after we do that just to make sure we're okay. I just added a tiny little bit. Okay, now the next step is to wipe the rim of your jar and this is really important, especially when you're working with meat or broth or anything that might have kind of a greasy film that could have gotten on there. Remember I talked with you about how you wanna make sure to take out, off all the fat uh, from your meat before you put it in there. Well, sometimes a little bit might get on there and you need to wipe that off but in the case of something being oily, you want a little bit more than just a wet rag with water. You want a little bit of vinegar on there too. So I brought out my white vinegar. This cloth is already damp. I'm just gonna put some white vinegar on there. And then I'm gonna use this cloth to wipe the rim of it because it will really cut the grease that could be on the rim of your jar, okay? And then we're going to put on a clean, brand new lid. 
Now, remember these days you don't need to heat or sterilize these if you don't want to. Just make sure that they're clean and put on a ring just like this, finger tight, and this can go right in your canner and wait for the rest of them. We're just, we're just gonna repeat that with all of the rest of the jars. Again, we're gonna fill up the jar until it's just about one inch from the top. Let's double check that headspace, make sure we're close. Yes, we are close. Use our chopstick to get out any of the air bubbles. I wanna double check the level there. Oh, we're right on. Now using our vinegar towel, wipe the rim. Put on a new lid, put on a ring, and this can go in to your canner. Okay, last jar to go in there. I do have room in here for two more jars, but I don't have two more jars of turkey, so we're just processing eight today. I'm gonna put the top on my pressure canner, and I'm gonna turn on the heat to almost high probably more than medium high. And we're gonna let this come up to temperature. We're gonna know that it's up to temperature because steam is gonna start coming out of this little hole right here. We're gonna let the steam vent out of here for 10 minutes before we put our weight on. But I'll make sure to come back and show you those steps of the process when we get there. So right now we're just waiting for the canner to come up to temperature. We're looking for steam to come out of this little hole. Now that there's steam coming out of the top, we can set a timer for 10 minutes. We're gonna let the steam continue flowing out there. And then when the 10 minute mark is up, we'll put the weight on it. Well, it's time to put our weight on. And I wanted to explain to you a little bit about how this works here. Now, like I said, this canner does not have a pressure dial that shows you what pressure uh, your canner is up to. Generally in a pressure canner, you will be canning at 10 pounds of pressure. If you're at a higher elevation like we are, we can at 15 pounds of pressure. And this weight, this gauge, takes care of all of that for you. Now I just wanna show you that this particular weight gauge is a three-part weight gauge. So this, this single part here would be considered five pounds of pressure. If you put one of these rings on here, that is for 10 pounds of pressure. But because of our altitude, we are putting on the, the second ring, it's upside down. That, that makes it 15 pounds of pressure. So that's what we're gonna put on the top of our pressure canner to tell us when it's up to the appropriate pressure. Now it's time, it's been over 10 minutes. So I'm gonna put our pressure gauge on top of there. And we are going to wait to set our processing time until this weight starts rocking back and forth. Now remember at the beginning of this I said, I'm doing turkey, but this is the same process for any type of cooked meat, whether it be um, turkey, chicken, pork roast, beef roast, venison, um, and you will be processing your meat, or I'll be processing, processing my meat for um, 75 minutes or an hour and 15 minutes for pints. If you were processing quartz, you would process for 90 minutes. But that is not until this weight starts rocking back and forth. So when we get to that point, I will show you what that looks like. Well, it's a little loud at the moment, but I just wanted to show you what it looks like and sounds like when this starts rocking. It just started, so now is the time that we set our timer. Um, an hour and 15 minutes is what we'll be setting ours at. When our timer goes off, we're just gonna turn the heat off for a while. When we get to that point, I'll come back and then let you know the steps that you should be taking after this is finished processing.
Well, our processing time is all finished. We turned the heat off and everything. Now, if you've been hearing chirping in the background, it, I don't think it's been really bad until just like right before I started talking. We do have quail chicks in another room and they're peeping a little bit. So sorry if you heard that through the entire video. So what we're gonna do now is we're just gonna leave this alone. We're just gonna let it sit here for actually quite a while. We're waiting for the pressure to come all the way down to zero. And you'll know that because this dial right here will drop back down to its original spot. That is when it's technically safe to open the top of your pressure canner. What's recommended though is for you to wait at least 10 minutes after this drops and take off the weight. After that, you'll wanna wait at least 10 minutes before taking off the lid. I really like to wait quite a long time. Sometimes I wait over an hour or if I'm canning right before bed, I'll just leave it with the top on it until the next morning. This is the reason why. If you remove the top too early, now after all the pressure is gone and there's no danger of it being harmful for you, if you remove the top too early and the change in temperature inside happens too quickly, the contents of your jars and really mostly the liquid part can rush out or siphon out because of that temperature change. Um, and you really don't want that to happen because the food particles can get around the rim and compromise your seal. So you really just wanna wait until you're comfortable taking the lid off. In my experience, the longer you wait, it's kind of better. Um, I don't like to, to sacrifice all of the work that I've done and have the potential of the seal being compromised. So I will let this settle down and cool down for quite a while before I open the lid. But here again, I direct you back to the instruction manual that comes with your pressure canner. It will tell you the, the minimum recommendations for how long to keep the lid on before opening it and removing your food items. So guys, I'm just gonna let these chill here for quite a while and maybe in a few hours, um, I'll take them out and I'll be sure to show you how absolutely beautiful this canned meat is. Well, it's been a couple hours. It is safe to open the lid. I'm just gonna turn it and lift it up from the back first, just in case there's any steam in there. I don't get hurt or get a steam burn. The jars are still bubbling inside. Let's take them out and take a look. Well, you guys, I hope that you really did see how easy it is to can up extra meat from a big meal or if you were just trying to clean out your freezer and get some things canned as a more permanent way to preserve your food. It really is easy and it is wonderful to have on hand. You guys, if you're enjoying our videos, make sure that you hit the subscribe button below. And as always, really the best way that you can help us here on the homestead is just to share our videos on your social media. Until next time, thank you so much for stopping by our homestead. Take care. God bless.